favorite things about working on The Stephen Kingdom is it gives me a chance to talk to a lot of different people who have been influenced by Stephen King in one way or the other. And oftentimes, I'm already a fan of the people that I get to talk to, so it's a real treat. Unfortunately, a lot of these interviews, we have to be very judicious in how we cut them, because otherwise these episodes would end up being five or six hours long. But there's so much good material. We thought, why not share all of this stuff with our patrons? This interview is with Charles Ardai, the founder and editor of Hard Case Crime, which is an American imprint of hard-boiled crime and detective novels. They release everything from new titles to titles that haven't been published for 50 years and everything in between. But the reason I talked with Charles, who's a writer in his own right, is that Stephen King actually published three original novels through the Hard Case Crime label, Colorado Kid, Joyland, and Later. So I got to talk to Charles about this and the influence that Stephen has had on his life and his own work. So enjoy. My first experience of Stephen King was as a reader, like so many other people's. Uh, I was 16 years old. I was an intern, an unpaid intern in uh, Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine in New York City. And a review copy of a big, thick book came in. It was the thickness of a phone book, and it was called It. And I thought, what a strangely simple title for such a thick book. How can you get a thousand pages of book out of a title like It? And so I took it home. I had never read Stephen King before. This was my first exposure. And can you imagine uh, what a wonderful way into the work of the man, you just start with it, you're really starting at a, at a wonderfully high spot. And I fell in love with it. I found out uh, later that my grandmother was a very passionate reader and had all of Stephen King's books up to that point on her shelf. So I didn't even have to go to the library or buy them. I, I went to my grandmother's shelves and pulled them down and started reading and became a lifelong devoted uh, fan. When I started Hard Case Crime, which is a line of retro style pulp fiction, uh, looking and feeling like the old skinny 25 cent paperbacks that people bought in drugstores back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, one of my goals was to revive the work of writers like Wade Miller and Richard Prather and Peter Rabe, who were big in the day or medium sized in the day, uh, but mostly are forgotten today and undeservedly. They wrote terrific books, great fun books. Uh, even some very famous writers like Earl Stanley Gardner or Mickey Spillane, who were world beating bestsellers in the day, uh, are largely forgotten now or not widely read. And so I had this idea that we would reprint great books from the old pulp era and also publish new books by current writers like myself who were not born early enough to write for the old pulp publishers and would like to give it a try. Uh, but we knew that if we went to bookstores with the uh, names on the cover being Peter Rabe and Wade Miller, uh, much less Charles Ardai, uh, no one would pick the books up. Or we were worried that no one would pick them up, even if we put great covers on them. And uh, I thought, who could we go to that loves this material as much as we do? Who might be willing to say something supportive so that even if a reader in a bookstore doesn't know the name Peter Rabe, they would know the name of this person and if they saw a quote, a favorable supportive quote on the cover saying, these guys know Paul for these guys are publishing good books, um, maybe that would incent them to pick uh, one of our books up. And I reached out to Stephen King, even though I didn't know the man, I had loved his books for years, but I had no direct way to contact him. And I assumed he was being uh, bombarded with requests all the time by lots of people with better ideas than mine. Uh, but I found the name of one of his uh, associates, I think it was his accountant, uh, who happened to have an office near where I worked in Manhattan. And I went up to his office and I said, I'd really be grateful if you would get this package to Stephen King, your client, uh, because I think he'd really love the kinds of books we're planning to publish. And I put the package in the hands of this accountant and then more or less forgot about it because I didn't think anything would come of it. And for several months, nothing did. But then finally, after a long silence, uh, I got a phone call from someone who said, I'm Stephen King's agent. And Steve asked me to give you a call. Uh, to let you know that he doesn't want to write you a blurb. And I thought that was going to be the end of the sentence. And I, so I started saying, well, we, I understand. That's perfectly reasonable. It's kind of you to call. Because he kept going, he hadn't finished his sentence, because he'd like to write you a book instead. When you talk about the magic of Stephen King, there's the magic that's on the page, which millions of people know. But then there's the magic of his personal conduct, the way he lives his life, and the way he supports the things he cares about and believes in. And he decided that Hard Case Crime, my little labor of love pulp 
imprint was something he wanted to get behind and support. And so we couldn't have asked him for this. I wouldn't have dreamed of being presumptuous enough to say, Mr. King, would you consider writing a book for our dinky little line? But he chose to. And he, he sent us a book called The Colorado Kid, which I thought was just terrific. Uh, he said, I'm not sure this is quite the kind of thing you're publishing. And I, I, I said, I'm sure it'll be wonderful. And in fact, it, it, it was. It's the story of a dead man found on a beach in Maine, and nobody knows how he got to Maine because he came from Colorado, and why he was dead. And without giving away any spoilers, I think the book has become relatively notorious uh, for not having an answer to the mystery. It doesn't solve the mystery at the end, and that's deliberate. It's the story of how some mysteries never do get solved in life and how we live in our world in spite of not having all the answers. So it's, it's a wonderful, heartfelt, moving book. And the fact that he gave it to us to publish instead of to Scribner, his usual publisher, or to literally any other publisher on the face of the earth, any one of which would have been grateful beyond words to publish it, uh, spoke to something very, uh, very generous in him. And I found over the last 16 years of working with him that that's very much true. When he cares about something and really loves something and is enthusiastic about something, he is the biggest supporter you could possibly uh, hope to have. And I, I've seen this not just in the way he supported hard case crime, but individual authors, sometimes not well-known authors, that he uh, reads and loves and tells the world. He's got six million followers on Twitter, and one tweet from him can make an enormous difference in, a, in an author's uh, career. And I've seen him do it over and over again. That, that sort of thing speaks to what kind of person he is. I remember when I first saw the, the Colorado Kid um, in uh, bookstores, and I didn't know about hard case crime. I assume I'm probably one of many that before Stephen came along didn't know about it. And aside from the striking cover and everything, there were two things that that hit me. One was this looks different than any other Stephen King book I've ever seen. So I was judging a book by its cover. But the right. other thing was we, I we thought, like it when people do that, <laughs> especially your cover art. It's great. It's it's great. Thank you. Um, but the other thing I thought was, oh my God, I just found a collector's edition of an obscure Stephen King book. I was, I was tricked by your conceit of making it look like an old book from, from the 50s and 60s. And then come to find out that there was this whole whole other collection of hard case crimes that, that so I, I know from, from uh, personal experience, just what Stephen King was able to do um, for not only your label, but just unlocking a whole other world of authors that were unknown to me before then. What you're describing is exactly what Steve hoped to accomplish. The idea that there were uh, wonderful books to be found again, rediscovered, curated, and brought to the attention of readers who genuinely would enjoy them, even though these books were written 50 or 60 years ago, appealed to him a lot. And uh, one of the things that he did when he set out to work with us was to remind us that the kind of books we published, cheap, physically small, um, entertaining paperback novels, the sort that you can crease and stick into a jacket pocket or a jeans pocket, uh, that that was the thing that he loved about Hard Case Crime. He wasn't working with us in spite of our aesthetic look. It, it, he was working with us because of that. And that's what Hard Case Crime has always existed to supply to readers. Uh, the experience that someone growing up in the 50s would have had going into their local drugstore and seeing a wire spinner rack that might have had 50 or 60 titles on them, wedged three deep into little pockets, and you didn't know what you were going to discover. Very often the cover art was lurid and had nothing to do with the story inside the book. Uh, very often you were going to pick up a book by an author you had never read before, but you recognized the uh, logo on the spine or the logo on the front cover, and you thought, well, gold medal hasn't done wrong for me yet. I'll pick up this new author that's in the gold medal line. And we set out to create something very similar with Hard Case Crime. There's a value to resurrecting wonderful things of the past. In our case, uh, resurrecting the style of popular fiction that was popular back before television became big, before the internet and video games, when spending an evening or two with a thrilling crime story written in ink on paper was about the best thing you could do if there wasn't a new movie uh, at the corner movie house. Uh, there's a reason that old paperback novels were a quarter when uh, movie tickets were a quarter. And our goal was to give something like that experience, a reading experience that's as inexpensive and as much fun as a night at the movies. It does seem like the Colorado Kid marked, I don't know whether willingly or not on Stephen's part, marked a 
somewhat of a, of, a, of a change in his writing because after that there's a lot more crime centric books that he that he put out from the Mr. Mercedes trilogy to the outsider. I don't know that it's because of the Colorado kid, but I do think that Steve has been writing in a broader set of genres in the last few years and it's very hard to pigeonhole him at this point the way he was early in his career as a horror author, quote unquote. People associate him primarily with horror, of course, but he not only uh, writes, but is phenomenally well-read in crime fiction and not just crime fiction. I suspect there isn't a genre he hasn't read. I, I certainly know he's uh, he's read high fantasy and that turns up in the Gunslinger and the Dark Tower books other than that. Uh, he's probably well-read in Westerns. I can't imagine that you could write the Dark Tower without having a great appreciation for, for Westerns as well. Um, I don't know how much he reads in romance fiction, but other than that, I think he's he's pretty much covered the game. I feel like the only romance I can think of is the like interstitials in misery where... Well, that's interesting, right? Absolutely. Only... But he did capture that kind of uh, tar and romance. Actually, in the uh, book we just published this March called Later, he has a deceased author uh, named Regis Thomas, a fictitious author who writes pot boilers. And his pot boilers are very much the sort of steamy uh, colonial America, uh, kind of pop boilers you might have read in the 1970s. So I, I don't know how much he read books like that, but he's certainly aware of them. I couldn't help but also notice that Brian De Palma, director of Carrie, also has a hard case crime book. That's true. Brian De Palma sat down to write his first novel with his partner, Susan Lehman, who's a former New York Times editor and, and an author herself. Uh, it was their first novel. And I think they had a lot of fun working on it. Having written it, they then published it only in France, in French. And that's how I found out about it. Somebody in England found a copy of it in French and said, did you know that there's this guy, Brian De Palma? Is, is, do you suppose it's the same guy who directed all those movies? It seems it would have to be, that's not a common name. And I reached out to, uh, to the two of them and I said, is there a reason you only publish this in, in France or would you be open to publishing it in, uh, in English as well? And uh, they were delighted. They, they thought it was, it was great fun. I think, uh, there are a number of directors in Hollywood, past and present, who have dabbled in writing novels as well. I think it's a fun thing for them to explore, uh, maybe because there's less studio interference and you don't have budget constraints and for other reasons as well. Uh, so we published a novel by Sam Fuller, who was this wonderful uh, grindhouse cinema director in uh, the 50s and 60s. Um, called uh, Brainquake, which was wonderful. Of course, you've seen that Quentin Tarantino has gone and published a novel based on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, which was on the New York Times bestseller list just uh, a week or two ago. And uh, so I, I think movie directors often like the idea of experimenting with writing novels. I don't think Brian uh, was specifically inspired by Stephen King, but who knows? You know, he, he also is a terrifically well-read uh, guy. And uh, I, I love the idea that there are other directors and writers, uh, not just in Hollywood, but there are certainly several. Uh, Frank Darabont was kind enough to give us a quote for one of our books. Uh, Drew Struzan, uh, who of course is one of the most famous movie poster painters of all time, uh, illustrated a book that we published that was written by his wife, Dylan Struzan, about the history of the mob during Prohibition. We've always enjoyed our connections, small and large, to Hollywood. And actually, Stephen King is part of that story too, because after we published The Colorado Kid, uh, we showed it to a producer, the producer that was making the Dead Zone TV series at the time. And they got excited about turning The Colorado Kid into a TV show. It took us years to put that together, but uh, it eventually got on the air on Sci-Fi under the title Haven, and it ran for six years. Eventually, in the final season, William Shatner even turned up on Haven as the big bad. And we had a lot of fun doing it. It was a very loose adaptation of the book, uh, very much inspired by rather than a direct adaptation. But even on television, Hard Case Crime's uh, success, to the extent we've had any, comes as a result of our relationship with Stephen King. And by the way, I'll say even beyond that, we didn't own the television or film rights to The Colorado Kid. We don't own the television or film rights to any of our books. We buy the publishing rights. And so Steve would have been entirely within his rights to say, uh, thank you for showing my book to this producer. Uh, you'll benefit by selling more copies of the book, but there's no reason that you need to be involved in the TV show. Uh, but instead of saying that, when we talked about um, the possibility that this might become a TV show, he was completely on board with the idea that I could participate in it. And so as a uh, young guy in his uh, 30s, I got my first chance to do some work on television. And I wrote a few episodes for the show and I consulted on all the scripts. And 
what an extraordinary experience that was for me personally, uh, something I might never have gotten the opportunity to do. Uh, and I got it entirely because Stephen King is a mensch. He really is. That's a consistent through line I keep hearing from everyone is just how kind he is because somebody of his stature, you know, surely doesn't have to be. You're absolutely right. He, he is a genuinely kind man. And even if he had um, only done one thing for us or with us ever, it would have been a, an act of kindness so spectacular that no one could ever duplicate it. But instead of stopping there, he has come back repeatedly and shown his loyalty and his enthusiasm. And the result is that hard case crime not only exists, but has flourished. And my job as editor of the line has been immeasurably more enjoyable. Uh, so I, I feel very lucky to have gotten the chance to work with him in any of these capacities and that I got to work with him in all of these capacities is, is really extraordinary. Well, Charles, before I let you go, I just wanted to also give you one personal uh, anecdote that was that was really like changed me f uh, from Hard Case Crime was your John Lang books. I oh, yeah. love Michael Crichton. And when I discovered there were eight new Michael Crichton books, <laughs> it it blew my mind for, for years. I, I just, I, I've, I'm actually, still parsing them out because I didn't want to just devour all of them. So I do about one one a year or so, uh, well, but that was- I will tell you just because, you know, just one last anecdote on this end. The reason Hard Case Crime got the opportunity to publish eight books by Michael Crichton was because of Stephen King. After we did the Colorado Kid with Stephen King, I mentioned to Steve that I had found these old uh, paperback pop lawyers that Michael Crichton had written when he was in medical school, going to Harvard Medical School, and because he didn't want to get kicked out of Harvard Medical School, which was a very straight-laced operation, uh, he published these very sexy uh, pop boilers under a fake name. And the fake name was John Lang, but he had never allowed them to be reprinted, at least in English. I think he had some Spanish edition somewhere of uh, one of them. But in English, he had never allowed them to be reprinted. And I asked uh, Steve, do you think we should approach him? And he said, yes, go to Michael, tell him Steve says he should write you a new John Lang book. And I, I got in touch with Michael Crichton, who turned out, by the way, also to be a mensch, uh, turned out to be a very kind, uh, generous guy. And I showed him our books and I told him we were doing a book with Stephen King. And he said, you know what? I've never allowed these books to be reprinted, but as long as you don't tell anyone it's me, as long as you reprint it under the name John Lang, I'll let you do one, just one, and we'll see what happens. And I said, you do realize, of course, that if we say it's Michael Crichton, we'll sell 10 times as many books, maybe 100 times as many books as if we say it's John Lang. And he said, I don't care about that. I love your covers. And I'd love to see uh, one of my books come out with one of your covers. Let's do it as John Lang. And we did. We published Grave Descent, uh, which was a book for which he was actually nominated for the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Paperback Original Novel of the Year way back when under the name John Lang before anyone knew it was Crichton. And we published it and he had so much fun doing that, that a few months later, he came back to me and said, let's do another one. Let's do Zero Coal. And we were talking about what the third to do should be. He wanted to do uh, Drug of Choice. I wanted to do Odds On. We would have gladly done both uh, when he died. He very suddenly died. And only five years after his death, uh, were we finally able to publish the books under his real name. His widow called me up and said, it's been five years. I want Michael to get credit for these books. And um, and we brought out all eight of them at that point. Uh, but we wouldn't have even brought out one if it hadn't been for Stephen King. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the interview. There's plenty more where that came from on the Stephen King Patreon page. And Lou and I would like to thank you for helping make the show possible. And if you know anybody who you think might enjoy the Stephen Kingdom, send them our way. Have them join the quartet. Mr. Lewis would be happy to have you.